I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we see. Some great readings today, but Trish, you get the best readings every time. Shun fornication, says Paul in today's reading. And uh, all of my instincts are to go, oh, there are so many wonderful things to talk about in all of the other readings. We can just let that one slide. But in Bible study this week, I kind of got double dog dared to preach a sermon on fornication. And that's a good reason to preach a sermon. Um, and, and it was more than, I mean, we were joking around and so forth. And, and the joking around brought to light something actually gave me a good reason to preach the sermon, which is, why is it so darn uncomfortable? Right? And I'll tell you why. Because these days, it feels like the church has no moral authority whatsoever in matters of sexuality. The world wants us to shut up. And in fact, when people think, what is the church's attitude to sexual morality, they come up with this Victorian brutishness as the idea of what churches are all about. Um, the, the caricatures, of course, are um, uh, you can do what you like, but you can't enjoy it. That's one of them. That's the Roman Catholic position. Um, the, the Protestant position is, well, you can do what you like as long as it's in the, within the bounds of marriage. Anything beyond that is definitely not okay. But if you're married, woo whatever. <laughs> That's the Protestant position. So, um, these are, of course, caricatures. There's some truth to them. There's some historical realities that underlie them. They didn't come from nowhere. But the reality that I have experienced, certainly growing up in the church prior to when my sermons are the only ones I get to hear, um, the sermons that I have listened to, I don't think I ever heard a sermon on fornication or sexual morality growing up in the Anglican church uh, since 1965, uh, which is an important year, 1965. Um, since the 60s. Our culture has defined itself in many ways as being rebellious against the old oppressions, particularly of the church, who said, don't do anything fun, right? And so we have this whole culture of rebelliousness that is now a multi-million dollar established industry. It's a rebelliousness that, you know, we, no rules apply to us. Everything's cool and liberated and we're so hip and with it and so forth. And this is better than the old days, the bad old days. Don't you, don't you do that dancing from the waist down. Elvis, no way, just put, put the big black block in front of Elvis's hips. You wouldn't want anybody to get too excited now, right? So, so you have this caricature, and you, you left, you're left with these extremist ideological poles in our conversation. That's why I want to talk about it, because there are alternatives, and there are alternatives within Christianity. And, and this goes to one of my rants, which is properly understood, Christianity has all the tools it needs for a healthy, balanced, and holy life, including in matters of sexuality. Um, so, so you have this public conversation where you, there's this, this culture war that goes on, and sexuality is, is critical in the culture war arguments, the place of women, uh, the, uh, the, the question of sexual freedom, and so on and so forth, and personal choice and autonomy, and these are the, uh, the terms of our modern secular debate. And yet, from where I sit, I, I don't think secularism has created a marked improvement. It has swung the pendulum, but it hasn't created health, balance, or holiness. What we now have is a hypersexualized society. Um, we, and, and even ordinary secular people are going, well, maybe there's something wrong with where we've come to as a society, but we don't know quite have the tools to articulate it anymore because we can't use the old words, they no longer matter. The word fornication, people would laugh you out of parliament if you use that word to, in, in the context of a debate on, oh, I don't know, the bill on prostitution. Um, so you can't go back to the old vocabulary, but you have no new vocabulary, and in the secular world, the only terms you have are essentially those of liberal feminism, which have a contradiction built within it. Secular liberal feminism has the contradiction between freedom of choice and don't oppress women. And nowhere is that word in the conversation around the prostitution bill. Do women have the right to sell their bodies for money? If they are free to choose what to do with their own body, then there is no moral grounds for saying prostitution is somehow wrong for being prostitution. 
Maybe it's unfortunate that people get into that line of work, but nobody wants to work at McDonald's either, right? <laughs> um, and so if, if the sexual part of it is irrelevant and you have freedom of choice of what you do with your body, what's the difference between flipping burgers and making money on your back? I mean, that's the, that's the absurdity. That's the absurdity of a secular, secular conversation. There is, unless you say there's something different about sexuality, there's some violation of the integrity of the person. It's hard to claim abuse in that secular model. Um, the Nordic model, which is we talked about, the possible way that Canada should go in our, our discussion of prostitution, criminalizes the Johns. Um, and the presumption is that prostitutes are victims. And so the language of victimization is, is the fundamental metaphor. But that's, hard, that's a hard case to make at the higher ends of the spectrum. It's easy to see at the lower ends of the spectrum. But at the higher ends, you, you know, there's a, it's a hard case to make that, that people should not be allowed to make millions of dollars uh, doing internet pornography, for example, if they make a good living on it. And they say, oh, no, I'm treated very well by all the people, all the other actors in the show. It's totally fine, right? And I'm making a lot of money, and it's my choice. There's no problem. And one of the criticisms of uh, the Harper government in its dealing with the prostitution bill is that they didn't take sex workers into the room to discuss the drafting of the bill. Not ex-sex workers, <coughs> mind you, but current sex workers. And so the metaphor, the, 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 the paradigm from which that criticism comes is the sex work itself is fine, but there are hazards in sex work that really need to be protected against. Right? And so the purpose of the, of the legislation is to protect sex workers from harassment, abuse, and, and so on. And, and that's because there's no language to say that sexuality itself is, sub is subject to another kind of moral conversation. So if you don't want to be back in Victorian times, and you say, well, there, maybe there are some limitations and problems with that, and you don't want to go where the society has gone now, there's no basis to say, well, maybe there's something more dignity and respect and intimacy that has another set of moral considerations. Um, it's wonderful that all those tools appear right within our own tradition. And in fact, the criticism of Victorian morality could have happened from within our own tradition. It happened because of secularism, but it needn't happen. And the criticism comes from Paul in today's passage, among others, right? Today, Paul is talking about the Corinthian church. Paul, it, it, Paul's, uh, Paul's passion is a particular question, which is what is the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, right? That, that animated Paul's letters from beginning to the end. And he started with Galatians, where the Galatians said, oh, we Gentiles have come to Christ, so that means we need to be Jews, we need to follow the Jewish law. And Paul wrote them and said, no, you don't need to do that. You're, you're turning your relationship with God into this rule-following relationship, which is not what faith is about. Relationship, faith is relational. It's an opening. It's, a, it's freedom. And so he goes on and on about freedom. Christ has set you free from the old imprisonments, one of which is the law itself. And you need to be free even from the law, that kind of um, attention to detail. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I, am I righteous or not? But then he goes and preaches this message of freedom to the Corinthians, and they go, woohoo! And Paul then writes and says, that's not what I miss. <laughs> that's what today's reading is, right? And, uh, and he's, so did Paul back off from the implications of his own uh, inspiration? No. He uses this wonderful line, all things are lawful, not all things are beneficial. That's the key to healthy morality in sexuality, among other things. All things are lawful. Not all things are beneficial. And what Paul is getting at is that in struggling with what to keep of the Jewish tradition and what to leave behind, he said you keep the moral and the spiritual teachings of the Israelite tradition and you leave behind the purity codes, the clean and unclean codes. Some things are clean, some things are, un uh, uh, some things are unclean, some things are clean, and a good Jew must always be clean. Right? And so you have all those things in Leviticus about what makes you unclean and clean and there are rules about menstruation and, and what kind of fabrics that need to go in certain pieces of clothing and you don't mix certain things that are not supposed to be mixed. And all this stuff is about being clean. And it's a purity code. And if you do this, you will be pure. And if you don't do these things, then you will be impure. You will be unclean. And that's where Paul says, no, that unclean stuff, that is completely irrelevant. And so when he talks about the meat offered to idols, it has been tainted by use in pagan ceremonies. He goes, no, it's just meat. They're offering to nothing. It means nothing. It's, yes, it's unclean, but unclean doesn't matter. It's, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Clean and unclean don't matter. So Paul systematically rejects every purity code. And if we understood that element of, 
Paul's teaching back 100 years ago, we would have realized that the church itself had fallen into, with regard to sexuality, yet another purity code. It had ideas of clean and unclean, and it was a very restricted idea of what was clean. Whether you're Catholic, nothing is clean sexually, or if you're Protestant, well, if it's in marriage, it's clean, but everything else is unclean. But it was essentially another purity code. It was morally irrelevant. And so that question of, well, maybe our categories need some stretching and don't necessarily work with lesbian and gay people, for example, or with, uh, with the changes in, uh, in, in, in the, well, what I call the delayed maturation of our young, um, where now the new age majority really is 30. Um, and uh, this is a live issue for us in our house because we're just now at that phase where they leave and they come back and they leave and they come back. <laughs> and eventually they have enough, and it's economic, eventually they have enough economic stability to leave the nest finally. And, and as, a, as a Marian clergy, I'm finding that most of the people coming into my office for first marriages are closer to 30 than 20. Um, and it's always the same story. Did they get their degree? Are they settled in their jobs? Do they know where they're going to live? They've been living together for years and years. I mean, I, I can count on one hand the number of people that filled out their wedding form with two different dresses on either side of the bride and groom. It's always the same dress. Um, two exceptions in 20 years. Um, that, that's normal now, absolutely. They've been living together for years, but they haven't been ready to commit because they haven't been financially ready. And of course, there's also the emotional question. Are we emotionally ready to commit? Is this the right person? Um, and so there's been this massive sea change, and, um, uh, and, and, and navigating that in, in a way that is healthy and balanced and, and, uh, and so forth um, is possible within Christianity if we understand the difference between a purity code and a moral guideline. A moral guideline is about the sacredness of the person. Again, today's reading from Paul talks about the temple, the body is a temple. The body isn't just a machine that you're running around in, that you can treat from a distance. And of course, when you talk to ex-sex workers, they talk about the damage to their own relationship to their body, where it becomes a thing that they use, and it damages their understanding of itself. That the, the, the whole notion of the, of the true self, the self that is the child's body, integrated self, the, the emotionally stable and secure self, has a healthy relationship to one's own body, among other things. or lack thereof, and so forth, that there is, a, there is a notion of a healthy relationship with the body. You can sin against your own body, which is Paul's language. So don't sin against your own body. So this is where Paul is going with his understanding of what fornication is about. Fornication does not mean anything fun. That's not what it means. Fornication is to sin against the body, to get a disordered relationship with one's own body, so that sexuality and intimacy and relationships become disordered. And that is the watchword for, sorry, this microphone keeps hitting my throat and then uh, <laughs> exploding. There we go. Uh, so so, the, so the, the principles are all there, right? We need to worry about purity codes. If you get a yuck factor, that's not a moral indication. That's just what is what tastes good to you, right? Um, I, I remember, uh, in terms of my own relationship with the question of gay and lesbians, um, I saw Kiss the Spider Woman back in the 80s when it first came out, and there's a scene where it fades to black, and you know what they've done. And I thought of myself as a liberal, and my stomach turned when I thought of the, the thing. It just was, it grossed me out, this whole idea of gay sex. Grossed me right out. And is that a moral indication? I don't think so. That's just. It just grossed me out. Other things grossed me out too. Russell Sprout used to gross me out terribly. <laughs> so you can't make me eat them. Not going to make me eat them. But that doesn't mean if other people eat them, that's a bad thing. Right? So this is what I'm getting at. It's not a basis for moral judgment. So that's purity codes. What's gross, what's dirty, what's clean. And those different culturally, in time periods, and so forth, and from person to person in some cases. So purity codes are irrelevant to moral judgment. We cannot judge and throw people out based on their different understandings of what's clean and unclean. That's not a basis for a Christian worldview. What is, what is the basis for a Christian worldview is that the body is the temple, and people are to be treated with dignity and respect, and you need to treat yourself and your own body with dignity and respect. And those notions of dignity and respect have to do with the soul, the integration of, of the, the body, the mind, the spirit, the emotions. All of these things are, are a precious gift from God that need to be treated with its own integrity and dignity. 
That is how we navigate this modern chaotic world. So it's okay for Christians to say prostitution is not cool without just being prudes. It's not about that. It's not because they're dirty and unclean. It's about, it's a disordered, it's a disordered nature of relationship between intimacy and sexuality and relationship and family and all those things which could be so beautiful and life-giving and in fact in, in the world of prostitution are not. Um, so we get all the subjects that Paul talks about 2,000 years ago, startlingly re relevant to today's society because we're all in Corinth now, people. Um, and, and, and yet here it is. And so I, I'm not, I don't need to shy away from a shun fornication sermon. I'm happy to tell you of shun fornication. I'll tell my own children of shun fornication. I'll tell you that. Uh, but uh, then I feel a little bit more like a Victorian than a theologian. <laughs> But it, it, in any event, it's just as relevant, and it is it, it holds the balance that is lost both from those people that are attached to purity codes and also by that culture which has thrown everything out to the winds. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the